Welcome back to Tay Radio Marin. I am your host, Santi Hernandez. I am so excited for this show. Thank you all for watching and the guests that are here. I am super excited. I know it's last minute, but they are currently here visiting from Texas, but they are here because of the Mill Valley Film Festival and they are part of the Youth Vote documentary. Welcome and go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ariana Toule. Um, I'm actually from Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. But yeah, um, I'm part of the documentary that's uh, being hosted at the Mill Valley Film Festival, which is called The Young Vote. So hi, everybody. And I'm Liz Magallanes. I'm from Dallas, Texas, or I, I live in Dallas, Texas, and I'm also a subject in the Young Vote film. Well, thank you so much for being here. I, again, it was last minute, and I met you guys. I was so excited going in, and I saw the 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 film, and then I when you guys went up there, I was like, oh my god, they're here. Um, but before we get into the conversation, um, I want to ask, um, what has been your favorite thing? Uh, right now in California? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good question. I I look just like the, the greenery, just like the hills, just like the nature aspect, the natural aspect of California is always, like I'm always in awe because I think that, I, I, we have this everywhere, I'm sure, right? But I think that there's something really special about the fact that Californians, you have it, you have everything like right, right here in your in your backyard which is amazing so I'm, I'm happy to thank you for having us in your backyard <laughs> <laughs> no definitely i'd have to agree i think like the scenery is gorgeous i love the rolling hills like i just can't get over like the view from where i'm staying is like stunning but i also just love the diversity because i think like going down fourth street in san rafael i've seen like every type of restaurant known to man which has been really lovely i like just feel oh, like i'm nice. part of something so yeah, I love them. What have you guys eaten so far? I think Ari's been here a little bit longer. Yeah, I've only been here for like a day or two. So we had like, I had pizza the other day, which was really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had a burger, so I haven't like ventured out. I got some Thai tea though, which was, Ooh. I love some Thai tea. Yes. Um, and then I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to devour um, whatever we're going to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> so I'm very excited to have it. But I usually, yeah, I love, I was telling Ari that I love Chinese food and I think it's harder to find good Chinese food in Texas or like authentic Chinese food because sometimes what you have is chains, which are like, yes, God bless them. But sometimes <laughs> you just want like a mom and pop, like a, like a small business, you know, you want to support small business. So well, that's awesome. Well, we're so happy to have you here again. Um, the young, I think I said the name wrong, the young vote. Um, it's such a great film um especially because it shares the work that you've been doing in the community and encouraging the youth to vote right um and the it's the director her name is diana robinson um she was also here um i think she did a great job and i felt so inspired leaving um there are documentaries sometimes that make you feel really, really sad, and that's how you just leave. But when I was watching it, um, I I got a tear or two, maybe even more, when I saw you with that power of protesting and really giving that passion and love and dedication on what you stand by. Um, but I want to hear more because the audience doesn't know the film, and I want to you guys to have the space to share what you guys are doing. Um, do you want to start first and then we'll go? Yeah. So I'll kind of talk about my work in the film specifically. And like during that time, um, it was like 2020. Um, so obviously there was a lot of things happening, um, COVID and kind of the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening, uh, um, resulting from the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and Ahmed Aubrey. Um, and just a number of different people. So yeah, I was involved in the Louisville protest movement that was specifically talking about the injustice around Breonna Taylor's death and then um, more broadly just talking about like civic engagement in Louisville. Um, so we did a lot of like voter registration. Um, we did a lot of just youth activism in general. I remember like when we first started our organization, we were like marching through the halls of our high school um, after Trump had got elect elected saying like, um, no one's like an alien or like, you know, this is everyone's home and different things like that. Um, 
but yeah, basically my work was just the protest movement in Louisville, um, basically, you know, talking about Breonna Taylor's death, bringing awareness, doing mutual aid and different things like that. So that was kind of the dimension of my work, I would say. Do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just, as, every time I listen to Ariana talk, I'm always in awe and, um, and so excited about the work that's happening in Louisville and has been happening for a long time, not just, um, obviously, yes, there was a there was a, a, a sort of climactic moment in 2020, but the fact that, like, you've been doing this work for a long time. Yeah, I two-ish years or two-ish, three-ish years before, just with, like, Louisville um, activists, and then it's still continued to now where, like, I'm happy to say that the Breonna Taylor case has moved to the federal level. Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. And we actually did a show on her. Um, I wasn't a part, our two other co-hosts did it, and we talked about how that was such a big impact, and it was spread, so like social media took over, and we noticed the power of social media, the power of like, you know, social media nowadays, is it's a huge thing in our lives, and usually you're just scrolling and liking, but... Th- it's a huge way to show what's really happening that the news doesn't show. Exactly. Putting it that way. No, definitely. I think a lot of what's kept like the Louisville protest alive has been, you know, not only just everyone's passion in Louisville to know that there's, there's a reality besides what happened to Brianna that's possible, but also, yeah, that social media, that being able to kind of mobilize in a way that, um, back in the 60s mobilization didn't really look like that so there's multiple forms to kind of get involved and um kind of still be present in a movement that you may not have immediate access to so i think social media is definitely a big part of that yeah for sure yeah. do you want to add something <laughs> yeah i was just thinking about i think you were talking about this earlier about sort of the democratization of um who has access to to media and to um to activism and advocacy that may look different in a, say a rural community or a smaller community where you might be the only one, or you might think you're the only person who feels a certain way or who is being impacted by a particular issue or feels very strongly about a particular issue, but then realizing that actually, no, there's like 10 other people who are in the same boat who are sort of thinking about those same things and, and are also passionate about making change right so i think that yeah absolutely the the democratization of the way we look at movements the way we look at power the way we look at politics and its impact on our lives you know whether we're aware of it or whether we like it or not right like politics has a way of finding of sort of making its way into our life i think we we talked Mm -hmm. about like we didn't choose to be political right our lives are inherently politicized as women of color as immigrants as as young people right in this country um you name it, like where our lives are politicized and often we are, we serve as political footballs in a lot of ways for, for parties and for people, uh, special interests and people in power sometimes who, who, who forget, right. Who put them in those positions of power and forget that they serve, you know, we, the people, um, even, even though there are, there are some things that are obviously inherently difficult right to deal with and reckon with in terms of our nation's history and it's and it's founding and we need to you know recognize those and, and acknowledge those but until we do that we can't really move forward so i think that this democratization of media and and who has access to it is is an important part of of movements yeah mm-hmm. yeah and i when i was watching the film and, and seeing the work that you've been doing and i really loved how you encouraged the youth very very much and it has a different um touch to it when other like when someone that that is young is says it to you and you're young and you're like oh man and like you said as much as we think that the the policies or the things that are changing around doesn't affect us sooner or later it like touches us it's like oh so it's important to have your voice be heard um and i think both of you are doing such amazing work i mean um even with you we talked about um kind of the work that you're doing to 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 include the voting as part of something in our lives that's important um especially in like minority groups that's not something very talked about um in our households um do you, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I think that there's, uh, I think we, we talked about this and we, we talk about building a culture of civic engagement. And I say civic engagement because voting is 
one part of that piece, one part of that puzzle, right? It's really mm-hmm. only one piece because when we look at our own experiences, so I came up in the immigrant rights movement um, sort of at the beginning of, of DACA. So like back back before we even had Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which again was something that was fought for through activism and advocacy, not through necessarily like elections, right? And so mm. it was undocumented youth who themselves were not protected, who put their bodies on the line and were doing sit-ins and were getting arrested at senators' offices, who really birthed this movement that then was able to accomplish something that almost decades of of activism for commu- uh, for what was then called comprehensive immigration reform was not able to accomplish. And a lot of it, I think, was because youth, because it was the youth who were involved. It was the youth mm-hmm. who recognized that sometimes we can't depend on these politicians to sit on their laurels to do what they've always been doing because that's not working for us, right? And so, you know, as temporary as, you know, temporary as DACA is, it was a major victory. It was the first major victory for our movement. And we know that it's possible. We know that when people are held accountable and when people are are made to face with, you know, their constituency. And and by constituency in this country, we mean everyone, right? They represent Mm -hmm. you, whether you're a citizen, whether you're a resident, whether you're undocumented, whether you got here yesterday, you have a certain set of rights. Even if those rights are constantly being infringed upon and you have to fight for them, you do have these rights, right? In this country, that's what we sort of built up as the American ideal. And obviously there's more nuance to that and there's more complexities to that, obviously. And that's why we, we continue to do racial equity work. But we have the ability to to fight for those things, you know, whoever we are. And so I think recognizing that the youth sort of led this movement and the, the mm-hmm. moment that we're in now with, with DACA being still under threat, right, constant threat, we need to remember that at the end of the day, the judges, the courts, systems who are determining these things that are ultimately affecting our lives and our families' lives, right? Because it's not just the DACA recipient. It's the, you know, people have families, people have homes, people have businesses, people are contributing to this society, people are human beings and they, they're, they you know, they're living their full selves, right? They're living as their full selves in this country. We need to remember that um, that, that was something that was, that was hard fought by youth, right? Um, mm. Even though some people are like, oh, geez now, but they're like, they were, you know, people, these are kids <laughs> who were in high school and in college when we think about it, um, who were doing this work. And, and so I think it's important to remember that, that those things come when we one build together and then when we also listen to, um, to the youth and listen to the communities that are most impacted, because oftentimes the youth have the solutions. We just need to give them a platform and to like, let us, let us be in those rooms. No, I couldn't agree more. I think the power of youth is like, so I don't know if we talk about it enough. I don't know if it's seen enough, but like, I can't like just youth, just they have this both an innocence and an optimism that I think that as you get older, you really lose. And I Mm. think that because of the way that the system works, that's why you lose it. If you had a system that maintained kind of your autonomy, that you could maintain a certain level of freedom, that you could depend on it, maybe you wouldn't lose um, what you believe the system should be doing for you and you become kind of um, complacent because you're used to what it gives you. Uh, But I think youth are so magical for the reason because they see a system that doesn't work. They see these older people who are disillusioned with a system and they're like, this is not okay. And they are a continual reminder of why things are not okay. And they're a continual reminder of optimism for a future that they're trying to build. And so I think like you, like youth activism, like we said, even with the sixties movement, like it was brought on by youth activism. Um, the 2020 kind of Black Lives Matter protests were brought on by youth being the ones to be like, yeah, we're going to get out in the streets. Yeah, we're going to cause a ruckus. We're going to cause a disruption to a system that's disruptive to us in our everyday lives. Um, and yeah, I think the power of youth activism is so is so potent because it's like not only are you do have the energy, because as youth, I mean, we're like passionate, we're ready to go. <laughs> but like also you just, you have this idea that the world can be different. And I I think a lot of times as older people get, okay, you know, you forget that the world can be different because you're so used to existing in the world to try to get what you need to secure your to secure your livelihood and to secure for your family. But youth are like, if we're if we're given the torch, this is not the torch that we want and this is not the torch that we want to pass on. And so I think it's I think youth are not only the key, but some of the best kind of cultural 
you know, viewers, like they, they kind of see the world for what it is, but also what they want it to be. And I think that's so needed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I didn't even, when you, when I think of DACA, I feel like it's so old, like it's a like older, like you said, the people have who started it are, are older, mm -hmm. but you're right <laughs> because the, the, the DACA affects, uh, those who came here and they were young and, and they don't have like they can't do a lot here um i have a current friend who didn't qualify for daca and i know how big that impacts her and but you're right the voices of the youth does have a huge power because of that like we don't know like we we know that it's possible like to us the impossible is not impossible um it's possible and so even when you talk about like them going on the streets and walking i know we did that and i think i mentioned to you guys we had an incident here but i want to hear as well as your experience because i know in the film you did a lot of uh protesting and i want to hear more about that and how that was for you you got arrested and yes. <laughs> that difference too of the the charges that you had versus your teacher who was right next to you was so to me was um wow you went out there you wanted your voice to be heard and you didn't care and you risked it and a lot like i think to myself and i'm like a lot of people might be like no no the police is there and especially as an immigrant like one of the biggest things that i that a lot of my family members don't protest and don't go because of that because we're told you can't have anything in your record at all if you want to get a permanent uh, citizenship here but do you want to share your experience um with the protests yeah absolutely and i just to pick you back off of that uh first like it definitely i would like to just state to begin with that protesting is although it's a reaction to an oppression there still is a privilege there and i talk about this in the film as well it's a privilege to be able to go out and protest and still come out with my life because there are many people who have faced police brutality and been killed by the police mm -hmm. who their interaction with the system caused their death um and so i would like to say that like even though protesting it's just one uh, vehicle for civic engagement. There are also other ways to be civically engaged besides protests that are still valid and very important. And there is a privilege in being able to protest. But yes, my experience with protesting um, was was so it was so interesting um, because I'd been part of kind of the the social justice movement in Louisville prior to what happened with Breonna Taylor, and the protests that happened were also a piggyback of not only George Floyd but Breonna Taylor. So <laughs> Breonna Taylor had happened, um, her death and her being killed by the police had happened um, a bit earlier. And so it had been kind of a m more slow build. Um, and then once kind of George Floyd happened, it was the kind of the the spark that kind of lit everything up. Um, but yeah, the first night of protesting, um, I was not out there, but I saw my friends and my mentors out there. And it was um, just, I felt a call to action. I really did. Like I just knew that I couldn't sit at home it just felt uncomfortable. It felt more uncomfortable to be at home not knowing that I was doing something than knowing that something could potentially happen to me. Um, and so, yeah, I went I went down the next night. Um, and the first night I was actually peaceful. I mean, there was, there was no police intervention. I mean, I went out, like, although the police were around, like, the courthouse, like, we were able to protest, we were able to march. Um, but it was that second night that we went out and when the curfew was put out by the, the mayor, um, and the National Guard was dispersed that it was like it was such a different experience. I mean, we were in a group of like 500, 600 marching down Broadway, which is like this pretty um, predominant street in Louisville. And um, I was immediately we were being kettled. And if you guys don't know what kettled is, it's when um, police basically break up large groups and then they go after all the small groups that they've there for created. Oh. So we were like walking down the street and then all of a sudden we met this line of cops and they started, you know, put in tear gas and then just broke us up. Um, and yeah, I was with my mentor and my high school teacher and we were like running through the streets together, running away from like flash bombs and, and tear gas. And we were arrested right next to each other because we got kettled in like the same parking lot with one another. But when we were arrested, the treatment was very different. I mean, um, like we obviously, there was a lot of brutality from the police anyway. So they obviously were rough and inconsiderate and, and felt like they were on their righteous high horse. Um, but then when we got 
um, when we got, what's it called? Booked. They basically, it took me forever to get booked. My chains were super tight. They were super aggressive with us. He got to go through earlier. His process was a lot quicker. And then when it came for our charges, I had three misdemeanors and he had one. And then he was released earlier. And then I was released of one of the last five to be released wow. from the night. Yeah. So I was in the, in the jail for about 30 hours. Um, and so my experience just on that first night, which is kind of like, like you said, like the climax of everything was a bit frightening, but like I said, a privilege because I was able to walk away from that night safe and sound. And, you know, that was the reason why people were out protesting because there was a lot of people who were not able to walk away from a police interaction safe and sound and had given up their life from that interaction. Um, and then just continuing, I don't think people saw this, but besides that, kind of the climactic moment, um, Louisville protests continued, I think, for up to 100 days. So beyond just kind of those bigger nights, we were continuing to to protest downtown. Um, there's a space in Louisville called Justice Square Park, which is across from the courthouse and the jail um, that was active and was like a community space for protesters, for people who were passionate about Breonna Taylor. Um, and the movement has kind of continued. So um I don't know. It birthed it birthed a lot more than just protest. It birthed the community. It birthed um, kind of like a community space, um, and kind of just a, a movement within Louisville to to really have a reckoning with how police interact and um, how they engage with the community. Wow, that's a very very interesting and crazy story. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, like you said, the. You just like when we when I saw that, I was like, wow. But then you're saying you guys continued that. And then now the it's moved up. And hopefully there's, um, a, you know, something great comes out of this, because I don't think that people, um, you know, they lost their lives and for nothing isn't isn't. No, that can't happen. Um, and it's here. Like I said, we had an incident with a. Uh, uh, with a gardener, a very a community gardener mm -hmm. who was here, and he, um, they were drinking outside, and they w were they told them like, oh, you can't drink outside, um, and they asked him for his ID, and unfortunately, um, he was trying to reach for his ID, and he like he got up, um, and the police officer said like you need to sit down, and he said, um, you know, I need uh, to get my ID. You asked me for my ID, and he uh, he stands up, and then there's this other police officer who's like so much bigger and and taller than him, and um, because he wasn't obeying, um, they tackled him down, and he was charged with so many charges, and. Um, um, but when they saw the footage, the they had to drop the charges because they realized that it wasn't what happened. And our community got really, really upset. We, But I noticed how our community got together in a way. And there was youth out there, but there was not so many. And that fear of, of like being hurt and and it's not going to do anything you know what am i walking for what but really when we we did a silent protest where we walked from the incident all the way to the uh police department of santa fell here wow. over here we walked all the way it was about like a 30 40 minute walk wow. and we walked and they closed the streets for us um, but it was a silent protest and i kept saying the same thing even myself because i've never been in a protest um i said what is this gonna do but then when i heard the stories of like what's happening with the case i said oh no that can't be that we can't accept that and if we we don't do anything it's like allowing that but if you stand up and you go for a walk uh with you know with your signs or protesting and and letting your voice be heard i think he has a very powerful message saying we won't accept that here because it's our home everybody lives here and it's um it's a shared space and so we need to come together and i think um thank you so much for the work that you've been doing i, I keep repeating it because and not it takes a lot of courage to do that and not being brave and saying i'm gonna stand there and like you said you got there out alive and i know that there's so many people who don't make it and even with daca i can imagine they did the same thing um i was very i don't i was smaller i don't remember very very well the i do remember that so many students were out there walking and protesting and um you can see how powerful it is when we all come together for sure 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that, um, that sort of bringing it back to how voting impacts our lives and how politics impacts our lives, like activism and advocacy, I think is such a huge part of it. But the way that voting, I think, ties in most clearly is the fact that looking at things like budgets, where where is money and power lie? And when you look at things like policing, whether it's you're looking at the, the criminal system, you're looking at the immigration system, or you're looking at the immigration criminal legal system, because oftentimes we see, you know, the, the, the reality is that uh, black immigrants are incarcerated at three times the rate of non-black immigrants, right? And that often gets left out of the conversation because that then creates nuance and complexity to issues that are, if you only saw, if you only consume mainstream media, you might think, oh, well, this is a, this is an issue for the black community. This is an issue for the immigrant community, which often is sort of, um, combined with the, oh, Latinos, right? Because all, all immigrants are Latinos, but this is not the case, right? Especially in a place like California or like Texas and, and, and places like New York and, and other places really across the country is you know that you have immigrants from Asian countries, from African nations, from from the Caribbean, right? Uh, and folks who are, who are moving in the world in different, uh, who occupy a lot of these different identities, right? And, and sort of the nuance that that brings, um, and really all of these things, whether it's police budgets or you look at, you look at the budget of an institution like, um, like the Department of Homeland Security, which was really created, this version of the Department of Homeland Security that we have now was created because of 9-11, right? Post 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so understanding why these things happened and how these things like surveillance or hyper surveillance in specific communities and in, in certain communities and how things like white ex white nationalist extremism are prosecuted different than other things that are deemed right terrorist a attacks or threats right like why is that and so looking and sort of looking and interrogating these different things and how different people as ari was saying who interact even with the criminal justice system have different outcomes based on things like race based on things like um economic status right these kinds of different things um, and so I think a lot of these things come down to the local level. A lot of the, the things that are happening, like you're talking about things that are happening that are happening in your community are impacted by elected officials, by people in power who are making decisions about your life that are that are living, might be living, you know, but might have their office right down the street from your house, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in downtown city halls. So I think like one of the big takeaways that we hope that folks have from the film is that find out who represents you. Because as I mentioned earlier, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, if you are in this country in this moment, you have a certain set of rights and people represent you. There's people who your taxpayer dollars are, you know, your taxpayer dollars are paying for their, their salaries, right? These politicians, whether it's city council members, whether it's uh, police chiefs often are, are, you know, their budgets are set by city councils or assemblies, whatever system you have in your, in your city or in your county or your territory, those people and also state representatives, state assembly members, you know, depending on your state, they're the ones who are making laws around gun control. If you care about, um, you know, I'm from Texas and so Valde obviously is something that happened most mm. only most recently, right? When we talk about this is this was particularly hard hitting because it was small children. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that it happens so often that so many of these shootings do not make it onto the news because they happen so often. Oh yeah, that's and, and and it's and it's things like this, things like gun control, it's all of these things, things around healthcare are happening at the state level. And so your state races, your state state representatives, your state senators, all of those, your state assembly people, those people are making decisions that are going to impact your life, sometimes even more so than the president. Because when you have a pothole, when you have an issue with police or you have an issue around safety in your neighborhood, are you going to call the president, right? You don't, right? You're not going to call, you know, at the time it was like, oh, we would say like Barack Obama, you're not going to call the president. You're going to call um, your city council member, the person who lives in your district, presumably, and, and who can speak to that to that experience who knows who is supposed to know your neighborhood. And if they don't know your neighborhood, then tell them, hey, come out here and see what's actually happening. Whether it's a stop sign that you need in your neighborhood, whether it's potholes, whether it's education, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's bail reform, whatever the thing is, right? Whether it's police brutality, whether it's, you know, immigration, all of these things have local components to them. Right. And when we talk about things like the school to prison pipeline, mm. those things are happening because we're allowing these in, these larger institutions and systems to be in our schools and criminalize our youth. Right. Um, when you're talking about the the criminal, uh, the immigration criminal legal system. Right. With the fact that uh, in a place like Texas, 
undocumented folks cannot have driver's licenses, right? And so a, a simple traffic stop can, can end in a deportation and, mm-hmm. and on and on, right? So I think a lot of these things, we need to remember that voting is not just about every four years of the presidency. It's easy to get caught up in that and to be like, well, yes, electoral college, all these things, like my vote doesn't matter. No, at the end of the day, those down, what we call down ballot races, those those candidates that are looking at your county, at your city, at your school board, especially now, I mean, even that's been politicized, right? Like school boards are being politicized, things around critical race theory and what people, what children and students can and can't learn in their curriculums, which is amazing because, you know, just not that long ago, we had, you know, coalitions of black and indigenous and Latino and Asian here in California, uh, communities, students, right, fighting for this curriculum now we're back we're back in it right knowing what is behind the person you vote for is so important um because I, i've seen this with like with like gun control where they say one thing but they're like funded by so many organizations that support um gun control or it can mean so many different things and i think that's so important um and i I'm with you on the voting thing of like the the president because that's how I thought of like voting is like, oh, you just elect the president. But as I've gotten into the community and the work that I've been involved in the community, I've noticed that there's so much more to it. And one of the things that I want to bring into my community is the education part, the education of like, how does it affect you? These, um, these policies are, you know, one vote can make a difference. It really can. And I've heard the person, one person who came here and said that there was this specific policy that affected our community. And by one vote, it didn't pass. And so I was like, that changed my whole perspective of like, Um, just voting for the president. And I think a lot of youth, that is what we have in our heads at times because at school, it's just they tell you register to vote, but they don't tell you why. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Why do I need to vote? Um, So thank you for putting that on the table because I think it's important to know that. And sorry, I cut you off. (laughs) Go ahead. No, I just had a couple of points. Um, No, I think that's, I think you make such a great point. And I would also like to say just like the accessibility of it. Like, I think that's a really, um, I don't know, a difficult topic because I think those local and state elections, um, they've become increasingly, increasingly hard to really track, to really understand. So I I don't want to put an air on that it's easy to stay engaged with them. And I don't want to put on like a false air that like, oh, you're bad because you're not doing it. Um, cause it's not an easy job, but because there's so much power in it, that's why it's not easy to find that information because you can, with a single vote impact local community. Like that's why it is so hard to find that information because your vote matters so much to the point where that if you do engage, you can completely change the system from the ground up. Um, and I just think that's really, uh, I don't know. I think that just show that goes to show that like, your vote is so important in these local elections that like if you do exercise it, it's a complete shift in what you will get to know as your community. I agree with that. And then you mentioned the access of voting. Um, I found it so interesting when there was a a quote or something that the, the person said in the, um, in the film where he said that it's, the advance oh i can learn how to build a computer on youtube but you're telling me i have to wait more than six hours in line to vote and when you bring in minority groups a lot of them you know they have jobs and they can't give up one day to go vote because you know they have bills to pay they have a big responsibility and i thought that was so interesting and i never like that's stood out to me because the access for people who have disabilities um, and even language wise, because as much as, um, it, you know, English is the dominant language here, but there's so many other languages and a lot of people don't vote because they sometimes they don't, can't read and they don't understand what that's being presented in front of them and they don't know what's happening. So I think that's a big, important part, too. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think like I I think it's so interesting, too, because like it's a concept in political science 
about what you're able to get from voting and the price that you have to pay to be able to vote. And so it's this concept that the more that you have to put in and the less that voting will give back to you, the less like you are to vote. Um, and I think it's so interesting because it's a, like people know this. And I think that's another aspect of it. Like it's not that it's unknown that the more that you increase barriers, the more that you increase, like you make it more inaccessible, the less likely people are to vote. But I think it just hones home the point that like if you I just want to add that like if you can't find the elected officials who are willing to understand those concepts and willing to go the extra mile to reduce what it means to have to pay the price to vote like you should be the one kind of putting that initiative like don't ever think that you're unable to be in those spaces because if you can't find someone who's already in those spaces become that person because mm -hmm. like there's no prerequisite to what that requires because if I'm, I'm a political science major and I know that this <laughs> concept aligns and like this is what makes it so difficult you are beyond capable of stepping into those roles of being the person that can one day be on that ballot whether it be for like city council or whether it be for you know any of these smaller or school board roles like if you don't see yourself represented or if you feel like you have a level of expertise in your community feel free to step into those spaces because like you said like there's no reason that in a high latino population community that there shouldn't be people who are there to help with translators there should be people there to assist there shouldn't be classes in the community um, talking about what the ballot will look like how to fill out the ballot giving more information but you know why it's because the people in charge don't see that need Need, don't feel that need and don't understand what it looks like to feel that need and i would just urge people on this podcast listening to if you if you see it if you know that it's there feel free to be the one to lead the brigade even though that can be scary that's another way to be civically engaged because it's all about getting those people who understand the need and can fill it into those roles yeah and and I, you hit on something really important which is that if you if you see the need like step in because you can i mean look at the ages like some some i think in in dallas isc the minimum age to run is 18. so like a high school oh, really? senior could potentially run for a school board and who better to run for these offices because then people who are in those spaces right now right or most recently um and i think let's look at the facts right let's look at the fact that okay who votes in this country people over the age of 55. Okay, let's look at what programs they have. When you look at things like Medicare, you look at Social Security, they have these safety nets, they have these programs that are benefiting a particular population because they vote. Mm -hmm. Politicians are always wanting to take pictures with abuelitas and with grandparents <laughs> and always at the old folks' home because that's who votes for them. Oh, okay. And they get they they get their real. You see all these politicians that they might not be down with like gun control, but they're they're all about Medicare. They're all about Social Security and protecting mm -hmm. um, the 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 interests of this particular group of people because that's how our democracy works. If you're involved, the democracy is going to work for you, right? And I think that we're seeing that more and more is that our democracy is working for a particular group of people that does not necessarily represent the whole of our of our country and of our state certainly in places like texas and california right um but we know that it's possible we look at states, states like arizona that were that were that are now deemed battleground states but that was a like a decade's worth like long journey from a joe arpaio who ridiculed and humiliated and persecuted immigrants incessantly and then was voted out because of this movement that was built from the ground up because they saw that hey these people are not representing us they're actively working against our communities and so we're going to step in we're going to put candidates in there who are going to represent the interests of this community who are going to represent our values and who are going to defend and res you know respect and and give our communities a dignity that they deserve right mm -hmm. so we think about what's important to young people we care about education where we want to be able to afford to go to college to afford mm -hmm. to go, go to trade school to be able to make a living for you know if you want to have a family to have a family to build a career mm -hmm. to be able to have access to these things like to be able to build wealth to be able to purchase a home because that's the fastest way to build wealth in this country and we know that historically latinos uh people of color right black folks have been historically through redlining and all of these other things and housing segregation have been left out of these these spaces to be able to have access to that wealth if you want to have access to that as a young person 
we have to get involved. We have to advocate for ourselves. We have to be in those roles. We have to run for office too to be able to, if someone is not representing you, great fire them like if you had a barber or like a nail a nail person a nail tech who like did your nails and like messed up you are not going to go back to that person right you're essentially <laughs> going to fire that person right we need to do the same thing with our elected officials wow Absolutely. And yeah no everything you're saying i'm like whoa <laughs> because it's so true i think that if you don't um see someone that represents you you can become that and a lot of people feel the same thing that you're feeling and i think that's what something we don't understand is that we think it's just us but really there's so many other people who you know don't feel represented and and knowing that you do have a say in it and i think that's something that we usually don't consider is that oh it's everybody else but you do matter your voice matters and everything that's happening around you um happens because of other people's voices if you're not involved um so definitely register to vote um and it, i a lot of people found it surprising that you can register to vote at the age of 16 if i'm correct you can pre-register pre-register some states, different yeah. states have different laws so check check yeah laws check those out um but i did see that and then when you're 18 you're ready to vote um and just getting out there and and doing your research and listening to what the the candidates stand for and and if that you know connects with you and if it doesn't that there are other ways you can do things um and Again, um, it's really encouraging that. And again, I see you and I'm like, wow, um, the work that you're doing. And as I know for, if that was an impact for me, I know that is going to be a big impact for, for, for other, other students, other uh, peers of mine, especially being a person of color. Um, you know, it's hard to see your voice uh, being represented in, in, in that. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, I think one way to find out is, yeah, find out, you know, we have access to the internet. Thank God. Like so many <laughs> things, you know, say what you will about the internet. Let's use it for good. Let's, let's find out, you know, if you're registered to vote, if you're in a mixed status family, make sure that the people who are in your family who are citizens, that they're registered to vote, make sure that you know who represents you. I think if you just Google who represents me on, uh, it'll, it'll, sh it'll show up, you'll put in your address and it'll tell you who's your Congress member, who's your Senator, who are your state representatives. Um, I think you might, for like the more local like city and county things you might have to go to your to your locality's website but um if you go to if you visit the youngvotefilm.com you can you, we have a, a partnership we're working on a partnership with when we all vote um which is an organization that was founded uh, and supported by many many people among them Lin-Manuel Miranda and Michelle Obama and many others but you, there you can find your registration status. You can find out where you can go vote, uh, where you can vote early, because a lot of the, you know, these things that are equivalent to poll taxes, like waiting in line for six hours <laughs> and um, and not being able to vote at, at convenient times if you're a shift worker, if you're an hourly worker, right? Things like this, language barriers, all these kinds of barriers that they're they're trying really hard to keep us from voting, right? Mm -hmm. To keep from keep keeping people of color, people who who they perceive, who people in power perceive or, or, you know, are not going to vote for them. Um, they're fighting really hard to keep us from voting and so to keep our communities from voting. And so it's important to find out, to be informed, where can you vote early? Are you registered to vote? Um, finding nonpartisan uh, information about where they stand on the issues that matter to you. And if they're not answering those questions, find out where they have a town hall. I think more and more you're seeing in person events, go ask them. Go ask them, email them, call them, go schedule a visit at their office. This they they represent you. Their job is supposed to be to represent you and to represent the issues that matter to you. So if if you had if you hired a contractor, you would be calling them. You best believe you'd be calling them, making sure that the paint job went well <laughs> or that whatever you hired them for went well. Let's do the same with our with the people who are representing us and making decisions every day about the things that are happening in our lives. No, I, I agree with that. And again, you're like eye opening a lot of things. And when you compare it that way, you're right. You you invite someone to do some work for you. You're constantly checking up on them and, and seeing if they are uh, fulfilling what they they said they were going to do. Um, and I, I agree with that. Um, and when you talked about as well, um, I wanted to also touch on the the part of your job that you've you've been doing um you're 
do you want to share? I would love for you to share that part. Yeah. So in the film, um, I was working at Mi Familia Bota, which is uh, one of the organizations that works pri uh, year round to really engage the Latino community civically. And that means walking them, you know, sort of taking the ladder approach. So like working with people through citizenship workshops, making sure that they have the access uh, to fill out the citizenship application to once they become citizens, make sure that they're registered to vote. And then once they're registered to vote, making sure that they have the information as all the things that we just talked about, which is lear learning what's on the ballot, who's on the ballot, what are the things, you know, sort of deciphering what the ballot looks like, and then knowing where to go vote. And yeah, Mi Familia Vota continues to do amazing work uh, around the country and places like Texas, in Arizona and California and, and Colorado and, and Florida where we're having and in Georgia now I believe where they're doing a lot of great work to engage Latinos not just when it comes to elections because we know that politicians are really really great about uh, busting out their Spanish when it comes to election season and busting out the taco <laughs> trucks and, and all, all of a sudden everyone is dancing cumbia or salsa or playing Bad Bunny. But we know at the end of the day, like, who's really investing in our communities, right? Who's really there and listening and really caring about our communities? And so... Um, I think uh, Mi Familia Ota is doing a great job of doing that year round. Uh, currently, I'm working at a nonprofit in Dallas called The Concilio that does primarily um, health and education programming and community engagement in Latino immigrant low income communities in North Texas. And what they do really lays the foundation because what they, with the work that they do with uh, parents and, and students in the community is building the foundation year round that's necessary to build a culture of, of civic engagement. Mm -hmm. Because through these programs that the Concilio does, we're helping folks identify the tools to advocate for their students, to understand that in the American education system, you can go talk to the teacher. Again, it's all about accountability, right? You can go talk to your teacher about, to your student's teacher about what is it that they're struggling with? What is it that you can, what more can you do to support them in their schools? on their journey, whether it's, you know, going to lead to higher education. The higher education can mean college. It can mean trade school. It can mean, um, you know, going straight into a job if they're doing like dual credit courses and things like this, where they can learn skills that they're going to be able to use in the real world. And so, yeah, I'm really, really excited to work with the Concilio. And then, um, Outside of my work with the Concilio, I'm, I'm also part of the uh, Power Squad uh, of Poderistas, which is an organization that was founded by Evo Longoria and America Ferrera and a bunch of other amazing Latinas that are doing work that are, is really a platform, a platform to uplift um, Latina voices specifically, because we know that in our communities, our, our mothers, our abuelas, our tias, they're the movers and shakers, right? At the end of the day, these matriarchs are doing so much for our communities, oftentimes going unrecognized, but mm -hmm. understanding that they are on entrepreneurs they are by nature like inventors like some of the most you know women are some of the most inventive people because they they know how to do how to make a lot right out of out of little sometimes uh, and even when when we've faced massive challenges in our communities right with black women obviously indigenous women latina women asian women um looking at um how we've we've really been able to survive and thrive in the face of these challenges is because we understand the value of family, the value of creating a culture, because it ultimately comes out of love, right? We want to vote for our communities, not just because we care about X and Y issue, we do, but the reason we care about X or Y issue, the why you care about gun control, about health care, about education, is because you know that you love someone who who that impacts, right? You want to make sure that that person has access to, to health care when they're, when they're in need. Um, you want to make sure that that person is safe to go out to the community and is going to be able to come back at night, whether it's because they're, you know, without fear of deportation or without, you know, fear of being brutalized or, or murdered by the police. Right. So I think all of those things are are, are important and laying the foundation uh, with with whatever programming. So even if you don't directly do voter voting work or you don't think that your your you know voting is tied to your work, it's all it's all a cycle and it's all part of of the puzzle, right? As we talked mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. uh, all these things are, are intertwined. Yeah, no, I agree with you um, that it's all connected. And thank you so much for for the work that you do too. Um, I know mm -hmm. you're doing this in in, in Texas, um, but it does remind me of like that the the power that uh, women have in in my at least uh, from a Latina perspective, um, like you said. It, women like my, my mom is a big role at, at home and we talked about this earlier too that that usually um 
we don't vote in the Latino community because we're like, we want to know exactly what we're voting for. And so the fact that you're doing this in Texas, breaking that gap and informing the community, the Latino community is so important. It reminds me of the work that, that I could be doing here too, um, especially because there's a big fear in the deportation part, the immigration part. Um, every time they ask me like, why don't you go out and protest? I'm like, I I think it's just something, I'm not saying I'm scared now. I just think it's something that's been put on to my community where like, if I go out, the police is gonna get involved. I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get this. Um, but it's your our voices is so important to to be heard and the fact that the work that you were doing um led to you guys being part of a documentary is also i'm like wow um do you guys want to talk a little bit about how that experience was being part of that documentary um yeah it was honestly so interesting because the time that we were filming was during covid and i i've said this before and i'll say it again i feel like covid for everyone was such a transformative experience um not only because covid is traumatic because we were going through a pandemic um but because i feel like everybody had a lot of time to stop and pause and look at the world around them um and then have time to sit with those feelings about how they felt the world was around them um and so i feel like my experience um in covid and during doing the documentary was very similar to that it was very transformative um for a number of reasons and also i feel like it was really illuminating um because we talked about this at the screening and um i think it it still rings true of that although our stories are being highlighted in the documentary um in no way is our work our stories are unique to us um the type of work we're doing is not um, people have always been kind of revolutionary in what they've done. And so to see my story be an example of kind of the continued work of many of the activists, not only in Louisville, but all over the country, mm -hmm. I think is what I'm very, I'm really proud of. Um, and what my story speaks to, not just on my personal kind of experience, but kind of, of, of a lot of activists who have put their life on the line, who have really taken the time, devoted. I think that's what's so kind of fulfilling about being part of the documentary but overall it was it was it's so fun it was so interesting our um director um diane is i mean one of the most bright loving kind people i think i've ever met and so getting to to meet her through the process and be connected to a lot of people who are doing similar work like liz and sophia um and darnell or dariel and elena it was just it was really great to just see all of our stories come together, kind of see what that meant for youth all together. And I don't know, overall, I, I had a really, I had a really great time. I, I'm so excited that it was able to be put together um, and that Diane was able to make, this is her debut film. So I'm so glad that we were able to be on this process with her. Um, and I, like I said, I feel like it was a transformation for many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, coming, realizing just the insp incredibly inspiring stories of people from across the country. I think it was always, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, it was tough, right? Obviously the, the things that we were, that Ariana, that Sophia, that Darielle and Elena were dealing with um, were very difficult because as of course the pandemic, but also all of the things that were happening in 2020 around um, racial justice and around, you know, just the mirror that was held up collectively to our collective right as a country and i think as a as, as some would say maybe as humanity really the mm -hmm. that we were having to to deal with the the difficult things that we that were always there but you know because of the pandemic were really brought to light um but i think it, it was challenging because people kept talking about how it was the it was the biggest election of our lifetime and, and all these things like that but at the end of the day it's like they're all important <laughs> they're all important <laughs> and as we're talking about like local elections and things like that so for me it was just realizing that one absolutely that we stand on the shoulders of great activists and advocates who have who are from our communities right um and and realizing that having the privilege to tell the story it might be my story but it's really our story it's mm -hmm. really a story of a collective of a people of a we that that taught me that taught us i think what we know now it's because of those brave activists that did what they did and put their bodies on the line, whether it be the freedom writers, whether it be those, those, you know, you know, what we called then the, the, you know, the immigrant youth, the dreamer movement, right. As it was known then, um, we stand on their shoulders and just to be able to be, to be, to continue to tell that story and, and what it 
continues to be and look like today was really a surreal experience. But we're, I mean, I'm excited to be able to to represent an honor to be able to represent our community. And really, that's why we do it, right? We do it because we want to represent our community because these stories, our community stories deserve to be told mm -hmm. in a way that is that is honest and authentic, but also joyful. I think there's a great deal of joy uh, in the documentary because we know that, yes, we're doing this difficult work, but we're doing it out of love mm -hmm. and out of care for our communities. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this, right? Um, because as we, we talk about... Um, we didn't we didn't choose this life it kind of chose us in, in a lot of ways and i think that that happens right whether you're an immigrant whether you're a woman whether you're a person of color whether you're a black person if you're an indigenous person these systems have in this country have always impacted you mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways whether you realize it or not and i think as youth we're re we're we're we have access to so much information and so much history so one I encourage everyone to definitely learn your history. I think part of making the documentary was I was faced with dealing with a lot of the the difficult histories of of Texas and um, and the country and how do we fit into it as Latinos, as immigrants, um, as someone who can't vote myself, but but represent a community where we have mixed status families, where we have so much potential for power, but really being involved is what's gonna was gonna really shift that paradigm as we've known it. So yeah, it was an incredible surreal experience and I'm so grateful to Diane Robinson for, for bringing us all together and to everyone who's made the film possible. And we hope that everyone will get to see it very soon, but definitely, uh, yeah, the young film.com for, for updates, because we're, we're going to continue to do this and we do it for, for you, uh, for our community because we, we care and we, we love our communities. And so we hope that we'll be able to tell this story on a, on a wider, on a wider scale soon. Absolutely. Yeah. I think your stories were very well, um, brought on to the storytelling was great I left very inspired again um, it wasn't a sad documentary it was a very powerful and inspiring documentary about that my voice does count um, and one thing that I was like it shocked me was when you were explaining the work you were doing and you're like but I can't vote but I'm doing this and and hopefully I can vote what would be an advice you would tell um, the audience out there or, or something you'd like to share that you think is very, very important, aside from the voting, which is very, very important as well. <laughs> yeah, obviously I'd say vote, um, but I also would say that, you know, it says this in the film, and I think this is a perfect point. You're situated in, you know, a long fight. You're not situated, like, in this singular fight. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be wins, there's gonna be losses, um, like, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs in it. So I don't want you to get discouraged. Um, I think that it's about, you know, in those times when you are discouraged, lean on your community, lean on those who share the, share the same values. Because although like we do have the power, like le I like to always acknowledge that there is people who are disenfranchised. There are people who have privilege. And when you are situated at an, in an, an identity that is disenfranchised and is oppressed, it's going to be harder to get to those places, although it is still important and your voice is still what matters most because you are being silenced. Lean on your community in those times because it's not just one fight or one election or one battle. You're situated in a, in a long journey of really improving your democracy um, and being committed to that can be hard but lean on those who share those same values because those those are the people who are going to get you through it those are the gonna, people who remind you of why your voice matters the people around you who share the same values are going to be why it's important that your friend be able to be in office your friend be able to vote your friend should have access to these different things so lean on your community and just remember that although you may not win every battle that it's still important to keep up the fight and that you know um it's not all up to you. That's why like the community building, like if you're able to kind of like have those cohorts, it feels like less of an individual kind of lose or win and more of like, here's how we go forward. Here's how we repair with one another. Here's how we keep fighting. Here's how we love on one another, even when our system may not love us. So I would just say vote, but also just remember that, you know, people who love you are out there and they are going to be the vehicle to help you continue in this fight. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think remember that we all have a role to play. So 
we all, it might look different for some people. For some people, it might be running for officers. For some people, it's activism. For some people, it's advocacy. For some people, it's, you know, helping folks um, with education, with healthcare, whatever it is. Remember that you have a network that, especially as we're talking about building a culture of voting, whether it's in the Latino community in particular, um, because I can speak to that experience, is that talk to your parents, talk to your tios and tias and cousins who might be experiencing some of the same things you are in terms of feeling like, well, para qué, right? Telling them, what is it that you care about? Because I guarantee you, everybody at your at your family reunion, at your carne asadas, they care about something. Everybody cares about something. Everybody cares about their family and wants a better, you know, what we talk about, like the American dream or what have you. As immigrants, like we talk about what matters to you. What does that look like? Is it education? Is it healthcare? Is it access to building wealth? Is it access to economic stability and to a livable wage? Whatever that is, start those conversations in your in your you know if you're doing it on social media with your with your friends and your family, great. If you're doing it at you know at dinner at carne asadas at different at different things, start those conversations. Be the person to raise those questions because then you're gonna get the gears turning in your friends and your family's lives. And then you start and you get the ball rolling. And I think we all we all sort of have a role to play in our own families and and know that you are you have that power within your own your own groups and your networks. Well, thank you so much. I feel very honored and it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you for accepting my invitation. I know it's last minute. My my whole team is not here, but um, I really wanted to be able to you know, use our platform so your stories can be heard and the the message that you guys are sending can be heard by by my community. And I know that my community is in need of it right now with uh, a couple of incidents that have happened here. Um, and it's hard, you know, when you see stuff like that. Like you said, we're one, one uh, community. So when something happens, it affects you. It affects how you see um, your home. And one of the biggest things that I've learned in with everything that's been going on is that yeah, it's I it's my home, but it's all of us, right? It's all of us. And if something happens and, and it affects me, I need to let you know so that it doesn't happen. Because if something happens to you, I will be there. Um, and so again, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I hope you guys have a safe flight back home. And again, I love the film. It was uh, awesome getting to see you guys up there. And um, and I hope that other youths can see this film and really um, get the courage to vote and, and lose that fear of of something going uh, happening to them that, that we know that reality is our voices do matter. So uh, thank you so much. And to the audience, um, Go ahead and register to vote, and if you are, if your state allows it, pre-register to vote. Um, and remember, our voices do matter. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. For Thank you guys so much.